So when we, when we decided to address the topic of, of precision public health, um, one name came to mind, um, and we um, were pleased to invite him to join us on the planning committee and um, as a presenter today. Um, Dr. Stuart Gansky is a professor and Lee Heisen Chair of Oral Epidemiology and Dental Public Health and Vice Chair for Research of the Department of Preventive and Restorative Dental Sciences at the University of California at San Francisco. He earned his BBPH, MS, and DRPH degrees in biostatistics from the School of Public Health at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. After, after receiving his degrees, he joined UCSF in 1995. Dr. Dan Gansky directs the Center to Address Health Disparities in Children's Oral Health, the CAN-DO Center, and the NIDCR-funded Coordinating Center to help eliminate and reduce oral health inequities in children. Dr. Gansky focused his research on oral health disparities, randomized prevention trials, tobacco initiation prevention and cessation research, and methodological issues associated with clinical and translational research. Dr. Gansky was a member of the Colloquium Planning Committee, and I'm appreciative of his participation here today. His presentation is titled, At the Crossroads of Inequities in Precision Public Health. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stuart Gansky. Well, thank you, David, for that kind introduction, and thank you, everyone, for attending today. Um, it's indeed a great pleasure to be here, um, but um, I have to say that I feel like I was kind of catfished a little bit. Uh, I was asked to, to help name people who would be good speakers and be able to talk on the topic, but didn't really think of myself as one of the people, and um, lo and behold, I, I sort of came on to the program. So um, I hope that I'm able to offer some um, new information for people. Um, I, I think the initial poll that we did in the beginning, as, um, as was mentioned earlier, uh, indicates that it is a new and evolving field. And so I think no one said that they are an expert, and I'm certainly not an expert, um, but I have had some experience um, with some of this. So, um, so again, thank you for being here today. Um, this, some of the work that I'm going to present um, is supported kindly by these NIH and NIDCR grants that we've had the privilege to have had over the um, last couple decades, starting um, with uh, the prior director of Can Do, Jane Weintraub, and um, Judith Barker, who came after her. Um, as director and then myself, um, as well as some other projects. Um, I do have some disclosures. Um, I didn't know I had some disclosures until um, we submitted a paper uh, which asked very specifics and I realized that my brother works at a very large conglomerate and, um, and it owns uh, one division bought, uh, the conglomerate bought uh, a company which provided a product that we were testing. So uh, 3M is where my brother works, but he has no control over who gets um, in-kind donations or, um, or grants from them. And um, also, uh, I'm going to be talking about an off-label use of fluoride varnish. Um, so I first came onto this topic um, a few years ago when uh, I had the privilege of um, attending a conference in Australia that's actually going to be held again um, this spring. It's every other year, and it's going to be held this spring in Hong Kong, so a little commercial for the um, Methodological Issues in Oral Health Research Conference, and it was being held in Adelaide, Australia, and as part of that I was asked to talk a little bit about um, health disparities and um, also personalized medicine, is, which is what we as Sarah mentioned earlier, what we sort of the earlier incarnation of this was called. Um, and so um, shortly after that meeting, I found that in um, Queensland that there was going to be a conference um, sponsored by their IADR division uh, 
inequalities to personalized medicine. So I was able to um, refer to that and talked a little bit about the kind of work that our group had been doing um, when I met with folks at um, the Australian Research Centre for Oral Health Research, ARCPO, uh, Population Oral Health Research. Um, and then more recently, um, in about a, year, about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago, um, or a year and a half ago, um, UCSF hosted the Precision Population Health Summit, first 100 days. Um, and so this was sponsored by UCSF and by the Gates Foundation, and was a two-day conference, um, which in some ways was an unconference because only about uh, one quarter, uh, three quarters of the first day were presentations, and the rest were small group work groups. Um, and it brought in experts from all over the world, from um, not just academia, uh, but also industry. Um, a very exciting conference, but I was only able to attend the first day because the second day we had an NIH site visit. So uh, I missed all of the work. Um, but it was very exciting talking about the first 1,000 days of life, um, talking about the, um, the prenatal birth initiative. Um, and trying to reduce infant mortality and um, increase health of children in the first 100 days of life. And so oral health has a component in that first 100 days, 1,000 days, but it's, uh, it's not quite um, as large as some of the other health areas. Um, so there were some fantastic speakers, and that's where um, I made a lot of suggestions to David for uh, speakers and ideas and directions that we could potentially go. Um, the roots of that conference uh, came out of this seminal um, monograph from the National Academies or National Research Council um, towards precision medicine, um, and it was chaired by um, Chancellor Sue Desmond Hellman when she was chancellor at UCSF before she moved on to Gates, and, um, and Keith Yamamoto, and, uh, who was, was the vice chancellor for research at UCSF. Uh, as one of the other panelists, but a very distinguished group of panelists. Um, and, and UCSF does have a very large uh, emphasis on uh, precision medicine and the OM. And so for people who are interested, you can um, click on this uh, video for the slides uh, to see more about that. Um, so from this National Academies framework, uh, or monograph, they came out with this framework of what they called a new taxonomy of health. And so this is similar to what we have seen earlier in terms of um, moving from uh, diagnosis to treatment to health outcomes um, and uh, using this, this knowledge network. And so it's a little blurry, but you can see that, um, that basically they have all these different layers of information uh, from the exposome to uh, the genome, signs and symptoms, um, to uh, patient out outcomes. Um, and then what I think is really important is the mapping uh, and the internet connection, which is symbolized by these lines. Um, this paper was followed, or this monograph was followed, um, by what I think is another really important paper um, authored by uh, the senior author, uh, the director of NIDCR, um, and at the time, uh, uh, Dr. Garcia was at NIDCR and is now at Florida as dean. And um, so this was talking about accelerating personalized oral health care. And again, these layers of information here. Um, but I also want to point out um, that among all of these ohms, um, one is missing that is really important, um, which is what I call the H ohm, um, but home. Um, and so Ruth Nojak Raymer, um, Dr. Nojak Raymer, was um, our program official, and she was um, instrumental in driving this home to all of us that, that, that home no pun intended, driving at home, but the home is, among all the ohms, um, perhaps the most important issue, a uh, place, uh, a nexus of impacts, and that we shouldn't neglect um, to incorporate factors uh, from family level. Um, and so that has had big impact on our work. 
Um, so we've heard a little from the previous speaker about um, Precision Medicine Initiative, uh, which has been rebranded um, all of us, which I think is a great name. Um, we had the comment earlier about um, companies and their, in, their uh, investment in media and advertising, and so I think this is a really great social media um, or uh, social investment. Uh, um, and, and so we've heard a little bit about what the PMI or all of us is doing. Um, so the goal for one half is to enroll this cohort of um, a million or more people um, to look at the interconnection between environment, lifestyle, and biology and improve health. Um, it, there's a, a very large network. Uh, this is a subset of um, universities, uh, industry, and other organizations. Um, so I highlight two of them here. Um, one of them is um, San Isidro Health Center, which is a um, federally qualified health center um, at the border. It was actually started by three nurses um, who uh, were Mexican-American immigrants who saw that their community wasn't getting the right care, and they created a health center, which is now um, multi-site uh, giant operation and um, has uh, their dental, brand new dental clinics when we visited them when they opened were um, state of the art and um, better than the ones at, uh, at UCSF in our school and, and, and um, integrated with healthcare and just a wonderful system. So uh, they, we've done research with them for um, almost two decades now, about a decade and a half, I guess. Uh, and another is uh, UCSF Health. Um, so, at the um, Precision Public Health sum Summit, um, Dr. Desmond Hellman talked about possible threats of precision public health, uh, or possible threats of precision health. And um, people have continued to be concerned about that, as we discussed a little bit earlier today. Um, and People have written about that uh, recently, and in particular, there are ethical, legal, and social issues. Um, in particular, um, concerns about the cohort diversity and representativeness, um, the possibility of exacerbating health disparities that um, only, maybe some people will benefit more than others, and maybe they will be the people who already um, have, have um, benefits coming to them already or given by uh, their their stratum of society. Um, issues around participant engagement, how are we gonna get people in, engaged and involved? And then of course, privacy and security um, issues about the data and about the uses of the data as we've already discussed a little bit. And then um, another paper which focused specifically on um, whether genomic medicine and uses of genomic medicine will increase disparities. And so if we think back a little bit at some cautionary tales, where are some situations where health technologies have actually increased um, health status disparities um, in, in medical health and dental health? And so if we start with diagnosis, um, colonoscopy, pap smears, and in dentistry, oral cancer um, diagnosis and staging, we have seen these in the past, um, and they continue to be disparities in prevention. Um, in, on the medical side, um, one example is hypertension medication. And so way back when I was in graduate school, um, Tim Carey talked about um, this strange data set that he had. And what he found was um, he had patients who were on generic hypertension reducing drugs and patients who were on um, brand new um, demonstrated by randomized controlled clinical trials of being more effective hypertension reducing drugs. And what he found was when he gave them prescriptions to his patients, he found that the patients on the generics had better hypertension control than the patients who were on these uh, brand new uh, drugs that were supposed to work better. And it took quite a bit of sleuthing for him to figure out what was the cause of this um, Simpson's paradox. And what he found was um, by talking to people, the patients were doing things like skipping doses and splitting pills, 
because they couldn't afford the new drug, but they could afford the generic. And so um, it was an adherence issue. And so there sometimes are unintended consequences and they can have giant ramifications. And so that's one uh, example. And in terms of dentistry, where have um, technologies not been um, accepted universally or accepted um, by those who need it the most, um, dental sealants might be one area as well. Um, and then in treatment, um, if we look at um, cabbages in, um, in medical care and tooth implants, we, we can definitely see that and the treatment choices that people make when um, they have a tooth. Um, we could even put in root canal here, I think, versus extraction. Um, so, um, so that we have this issue, uh, we have this uh, potential problem that there's this, um, we're really excited about this new technology, this new um, potential to advance health, uh, but there are also some concerns. And so um, some folks have written about this and called it a Faustian bargain. Um, and so again, uh, a new technology can sometimes create more than it destroys, or it can do the reverse, and it's important to, to look at this. Um, so given that we're in San Antonio and we're in the, um, whoops, in the uh, Gunther Hotel, uh, I thought, well, maybe we should think about this as a Johnsonian bargain, um, because if, uh, if people haven't seen yet, um, Robert Johnson um, recorded in room 414 of this hotel in 1936, he recorded um, blues songs, including the Crossroad Blues. And the mythology of the Crossroad Blues is uh, that he went down to the crossroads and made a deal with the devil in order to become a great guitarist and uh, be able to perform the wonderful music that he did and craft that music. Um, so. We, we, are, we now stand at the crossroads, and um, so Sarah and I did not coordinate our metaphors of roads and crossroads, um, but, but I'm glad that we, we both have uh, four cardinal directions in, in ours. Um, and so we have the opportunity to choose and to craft where things go. Um, and early on in this process at where we are now, we have the opportunity to have an impact. So. Um, as Dr. Desmond Hellman said at the Precision Population Summit, um, we have threats to these opportunities, but we, we, have, we have potential threats of increasing health disparities, but we can turn these threats into opportunities. And we could actually think about ways where we could reduce health disparities using some of these technologies. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about more about all of us and some of the things that, that are being done to try to address some of the concerns we talked about earlier, which is representativeness and generalizability. And so um, all of us has a, this mobile unit. They travel around the country. Um, so they are visiting lots of places. Um, just in the November, December, they've been in Texas. Uh, they've been here, and maybe they should think about um, reaching out to their community and, and specific rebranding, and, and maybe um, it should be called All Y'all for Texas. Um, but the idea is that they're going to where the people are, um, trying to engage them, trying to recruit them, trying to, to be... Um, engage them as members of the community to be part of this effort um, and not to be left out. And so they're visiting all over the Southwest um, this uh, late fall, early winter. Um, and um, some of them, some of these centers uh, are very specific. Some of them are kind of more uh, maybe not the best for getting engagement, but we do want everybody to be represented. I'm not sure that the Tucson Marathon is where we're gonna find the people who need the prevention the most, um, but, um, but they are trying to engage everyone. Uh, and then uh, they've moved on to California, and one of the sites is uh, San Isidro Health Center in the San Diego area. And then um, today, 
Uh, they are in Bakersfield, California. Um, they're not at the Baskets Family Rodeo, but they're at the Maya Cinemas. Um, and so they're going to where they think uh, the people are that they want to try to engage. So um, they're making those, those efforts. And I should also um, point out No, I, sorry, I covered up the button. There's a, there's a button on these web pages next to login. I think it's probably about here, which says um, Espanol. So if you click on that button, everything then appears in Spanish. So again, trying to reach out to the communities in, in ways uh, to engage them. Um, so, so that's one side that, that's really important, which is um, getting the right cohorts, getting the data, getting the representativeness that we need. Um, another important part is the actual methodology. And so um, there are some concerns. Uh, so this recent paper talked about concerns that we have a two-tiered healthcare system. Uh, if we add omics, we're gonna end up with a two-tiered personalized healthcare system. Uh, and, and that we need to be careful and we need to do things right. And from a methodology point of view, they also um, want to talk about uh, the bi bias variance trade-off and curse of dimensionality. So um, when we're collecting all of this data, we're collecting you know, a giant tidal wave of information. So the bias variance trade-off says that um, as we increase dimensionality or the amount of information, right? So these are, this is the variables, number of variables, um, that there's, there's pros and cons. This is like a balance, and we wanna choose something that's, that's a balance between one of these two trade-offs. And so um, on the one hand, you could end up with um, models that reproduce really well. Maybe we put in all of this information, um, you know, 100,000 variables, and what we come out with is let's use uh, poverty. Um, that's a, that's a probably going to be a really robust model. Um, but it's not telling us things that are novel or new or um, maybe going to move the needle. Um, on the other hand, um, if we have too many variables, uh, we might get decreased precision. We might have a model that is unstable. We might have a model that, um, that doesn't hold up when you add more information to it. Um, and so um, it's really important to get that balance right. Um, there are sources of variability um, from both noise and true biological heterogeneity. And so noise would come from things like sampling variation, um, measurement error, and those sorts of things. True heterogeneity would come from uh, actual variability in, um, in people's uh, genes and other, from other sources. Um, and then really, the, I think the, the most important thing is to validate these models both internally and externally with all of the right um, groups of people that we want to have involved. Um, and so I have a very simplistic example to illustrate what I mean when I say validate and why it's important. And so here we only have two dimensions. So we have some made up data of a predictor uh, and a response, and uh, we can fit a regression model to that. Um, we can also fit, and I've seen um, a student researcher do something very similar to this, the maximal degree polynomial possible for the number of data points that you have. Uh, we could also fit this, this line to it. Um, Hey, the R square, it's better. Let's use that one. R square of one. That's great. Um, but the problem is um, the bias variance trade off. When you add another data point um, here, uh, that data point does not fit this well at all. So hopefully that um, helps illustrate uh, what's a little more complicated than that, but it gives you an example of what I'm talking about when I'm saying why it's important to validate and what that trade-off is. Um, so this slide, I, I was going to change the, the title here, but I decided not to, to, to make a point. So the same slide um, uh, I used when I was talking about knowledge discovery and data mining, um, then the buzzword became machine learning, and then deep learning, and BD2K, or big data to knowledge. 
and I'm not saying that everything is the same and we change the title, but um, the, there's a lot of the same things that apply to, to all of these new technologies that try to guide us uh, based on a big uh, tidal wave of information. So um, in, back in 2001, the MIT Tech Review called uh, knowledge discovery and data mining, a semi-automatic discovery of patterns, associations, anomalies, statistically significant structures and data. Sounds great. Uh, I want that. Um, and it's the interface of these disciplines. And, um, you know, there are, have, has been an interest group for quite some time in the uh, Association of Computational Mathematics. Um, and they have a competition or, um, for who's got the best algorithms to, to find patterns in data. Um, but uh, one thing about data mining, so uh, I moved to, to San Francisco about 21 years ago, and, and San Francisco, as most people know, um, a big part of San Francisco's found, founding was the gold rush. And so who made the most money in the gold rush? It wasn't the miners, it was the people who supplied the miners. It was Levi Strauss. It was uh, the people who had the hardware store and sold the pickaxes and so on. And so, just as a cautionary tale, uh, anytime somebody's you know, promising you something that sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. Um, and, and data mining, or in some ways BD2K, I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I'm trying to be realistic. Uh, you know, if someone's promising to take lead, put it into a black box, and give you gold, um, you know, wait till you see the results before you make your uh, more than a small down payment on that system. So, um, just a, a cautionary tale. So, um, knowledge discovery and data mining tools um, include uh, the traditional statistical algorithms. They include things from um, machine language learning, uh, new technologies, uh, so for example, random forests uh, and other things support vector machines, machine learning and, and deep learning. Um, and uh, they can be either supervised learning or unsupervised learning, and basically unsupervised learning means that um, it's a kind of clustering of um, of risks, let's say, or potential risk factors. Uh, there's no outcome um, that we're using to generate that uh, combination of things. Uh, so we can use these different methods, um, and we can go through these different steps. Again, you could replace this with BD2K uh, if, you, if you like, but um, I've, I've, I've left it there for a reason. So collect and store the data. Um, Uh, you can warehouse it, sample it, merge it, warehouse it. You can pre-process it, which is an important step uh, of cleaning and imputation and standardization. Uh, analyze using these kinds of tools, including visualization. And then validation is really important, as I've said before, um, different kinds of validation. And then act. Uh, and then this is, is kind of like a PDSA cycle in that you... There, it's not a linear process. There, there's some, as we learn things, we might backtrack and realize, oh, we have to clean that data a bit much. We need to standardize these measures. These different um, clinic, clinics measure this variable in a different way, and so we need to standardize them um, to, based on which lab they sent that data to. Um, in terms of validation, uh, there are a number of different methods. Uh, cross-validation, um, bootstrapping, and so on. Um, and these are all internally with the one data set. External would be to take a data set that wasn't used to develop the model or do any of the analysis and see how well that uh, replicates. Um, so, and then what we ultimately like to do is to intervene with patients, individual patients, um, to set policies to improve healthcare. Um, and so, um, this was part of a uh, NIDCR and NLM conference on um, dental informatics, uh, and so they had a, a special issue of, of advances where that was published. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about is data quality, um, garbage in, garbage out. Um, I um, could probably have done my whole talk with a whole set of Dilbert slides. Um, 
Uh, this one talks about you know, knowing that the data is bad, uh, but using it anyway, um, and which is not a good idea, not a good thing to do. Um, and so some variables we know are going to be important, but we may not be able to get a good measure of them, and it may not be worth uh, going through it. So we want, need to make sure that we have good data going in. Um, I also put in this uh, slide, um, this was, is specific to artificial neural net models, um, but uh, I think it also applies in a lot of ways to BD2K kinds of uh, data and the kinds of issues that may come up uh, with overfitting, uh, lack of validation, um, having things that, that don't, uh, not actually looking at, say, a simple regression model as a competitor and see how well this does, or a simple um, standard kind of model and seeing how well it does. Um, I should also um, point out that um, uh, that uh, one um, the the person who who the, one of the co-authors on the random forests uh, paper, um, Leo Bryman, said that what he likes to do is th is make up some variables, uh, some generate some random data uh, with a random number generator and throw that in. And if he has a model and that um, variable ends up in the model, he knows something's wrong, or at least it should be wrong 5% um, of the time or something like that, but um, depending on what you use. But, uh, but he, he will throw in variables just as a sort of um, uh, check to make sure that, that um, the models are not coming up with something that's crazy. Um, the other thing I want to mention, which we don't think about a whole lot, uh, in general, when we talk about these kinds of issues in preci precision public health, is what about text data? What about free text? What about all the information in the electronic health record, uh, soap notes, and other kinds of things? Um, are those things useful? And so there's a couple papers that have used text from electronic health records. Um, that I can't remember if they used natural language processing, but they're using some kind of algorithmic way to process all of this information. And they found um, that early adverse childhood experiences like um, abuse, um, homelessness, um, lack of a, a, um, what we think of as a, as a um, safe environment for children in which to grow up, uh, food insecurity and so on, that those issues documented early on in, in an electronic health record were later related to um, poor health outcomes. Um, and there's another paper, recent paper, that talks about care coordination. Um, and so care coordination information was in the EHR. And they were able to show that um, the patients who had the care coordination actually um, overcame psychosocial distress more than those who didn't. So, um, th let's not neglect the text, um, and um, I'd also like to uh, address one of the questions earlier about what are we doing about industry? What are we doing about um, big sugar, big tobacco, um, big pharma? Um, and uh, put in a plug that UCSF has um, a giant repository of not just the tobacco papers, uh, which people may have heard about, um, but also um, papers on big pharma and uh, the chemical industry and, um, and in the spring we'll be launching um, big sugar, uh, sugar papers. And so there's hundreds and thousands of uh, pages of documents. Um, and I just saw a talk last week by one of our librarians um, who uh, is the, the curator of that. And um, so if you go to industry, I think it's industrydocuments.ucsf.edu, but if you, if you Google that, uh, you will come up to their search engine and you can get um, metadata, you can get the PDFs, you can get all kinds of information to, uh, out, of, out of those. So um, I would encourage people to, to think about uh, those kinds of projects as well. Um, so again, like I said, I could have a whole lecture made up of Dilbert cartoons on this, but um, uh, we also should, at the end of the day, when you get your model out, uh, look at it and say, you know, does it have face validity? Does it, does it actually uh, give you something that makes sense? And so, um, you know, there's 
uh, if he makes this face, it gets better sales. But, but I put this, uh, I, I didn't put my embarrassing slide uh, that I have from doing some of this data mining and presenting it to um, Dr. Ruth Nojak Raymer, uh, in which she sort of said, why, why is that variable go in that direction? That doesn't make any sense. And it was something I hadn't thought about. Um, and uh, even though I did my validation and all of that, internal validation, um, you know, we didn't go forward with that model because it didn't make much sense. It wasn't interpretable. And when we went and looked at the data, it was, uh, even though we had a pretty big data set, it was a small number of people who were driving that particular um, pattern. So um, prediction is only good as the data and the model. Uh, so here's some uh, people who are sort of notorious uh, for their predictions. Um, so that's, I'll get off my uh, prediction soapbox um, and the, the pitfalls and uh, problems with prediction models and um, talk a little bit more about um, social determinants of health. And so as we've seen before, all of us, uh, aims to put together those three different general areas, um, but, but they also want to look at individu individual family and community level information, so environmental as it, as it was called. Uh, we can look at poverty, education, health literacy, and um, another one where I've seen precision public health applied is home conditions. And so at the um, precision public health first 1,000 days con summit, um, there was um, someone from uh, Cincinnati, from uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital, and they actually ask about the home conditions um, in the pediatric visits. Um, they, when they hear about um, mold, they hear about um, substandard housing, they actually write a prescription and hand it to the person and then connect that person to legal services, and they have sued slum landlords to fix the housing in their communities in Cincinnati. And they've done this because they've collected the data in their EHR, they have made the connections with the community, and they ha has made big, big public health impacts um, in their communities because people have to fix it and then the children's health actually can improve. Um, and so there's another more recent one about um, uh, mold and respiratory conditions in the home relating to asthma uh, in particular, uh, and so that one's published there. And then, of course, there are things like secondhand smoke, uh, and one that we might be um, concerned about in oral health, because it has an oral health impact on caries, which is lead in the water, and of course, we've heard horrific stories about um, communities uh, like Flint, uh, but we also have other places where there may be lead in the water. And so maybe these are areas, places, where we can take that uh, potential problem of exacerbating health disparities and turn it upside down and, and turn it into uh, a pen pen potential solution to impact the communities. <clears throat> um, so next I wanted to show you um, one result uh, from an analysis that uh, uses somewhat old data. Um, so this is um, 1993, 1994, the California Oral Health Needs Assessment of Children, and um, Dr. Pollack was actually instrumental in organizing this uh, statewide needs assessment. Um, and we analyzed some of the data, and what we did is we took the, at the time, the um, American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry's CARES assessment tool, and we took that data and we ran it through the tool. And what we found was that um, in the data set, 48% uh, of the kids had any caries experience. Um, but we found that this tool uh, classified 98% of those with caries as high risk or moderate risk, and only 2% at low, as low risk. So it looks like it's working pretty well. But the problem is that it also uh, classified among the, the half who didn't have caries, 93% um, of them as high risk or moderate risk. And so one of the problems in using social determinants of health, this was mostly driven by, the, by things like measures of poverty, some kind of measure of, um, of uh, socioeconomic status. Um, that, uh, that 
it's not a blunt instrument. You need to apply it carefully, and um, you can't just add up all of these things, and if anybody has any one of these things, consider them as being high risk. So this had uh, pretty bad, a really, really low specificity, a very high sensitivity, but um, not a very good tool. Um, so we need to look at um, multidimensional. Uh, so this is um, a model that we have used uh, in our research center, um, it's become known as the Fisher-Owens model, um, and so it's looking at child, family, and community level effects on children's oral health. Um, there's another uh, new model that I saw that um, where people are talking about its application to precision public health, uh, which has this really long name, Integrative Social Molecular Pathological Epidemiology. Uh, it's a new field, uh, burgeoning field of combining social epidemiology with molecular pathological epidemiology, and so um, I refer people who are interested to this paper. It's kind of an interesting paper about melding those two disciplines together, or sub-disciplines. And then in our research center, uh, we've had some work in um, metagenomics. My colleague um, Ling Zhan uh, has looked at uh, antibiotic uh, peptide clusters of mutant streptococci um, with uh, children with caries and without caries and seen um, patterns of particular, uh, particular genes that, that uh, have um, more expression in kids with caries. Um, we ha I have a colleague, um, Jing Cheng, who's, who's done work on um, developing mediation models, so she's developed the tools for mediation modeling. And so one example where, where she's used that has been in um, John Featherstone's uh, caries assessment by, by management by risk assessment trial, where in the original trial we saw a strong association between the intervention and caries risk, um, but only a, a modest and not statistically significant relationship to the dental outcome. And so um, the question was, well, uh, this is the mechanism of action through changing caries risk. So um, how does this work? So she developed these um, mediation models for non-normal normally distributed data, uh, and she was able to tease out this relationship, and so the mediation effect um, is statistically significant, showing that the intervention uh, changed the mediators, the risk levels, which then uh, changed the outcomes in, uh, two years later in adults. Um, and so there are new tools out there uh, that are being developed. Uh, I also want to show a couple other um, precision public health analyses of using different kinds of data uh, that some of my colleagues and I have, um, have performed. So the question is, in this one, um, does mother's salivary mutant strepti cause caries in preschoolers? And these were kids who were going to the FQHC in San Isidro, California, um, and the, followed over um, for uh, two and a half years. And um, sorry, for three years for the kids, but the um, mother's uh, bacterial levels were um, through two and a half years. Uh, and so what um, Ben Chaffee found is that mothers with high mutant streptococci levels over this whole period um, had children with significantly greater chance of caries. So um, showing this uh, microbiome effect. Um, um, another colleague, Anne Lazar, um, has developed, used some heterogeneity of treatment effect methods um, and uh, developed some new methods um, to assess questions of are there subgroups of the population that are benefiting more or would benefit more from a particular treatment. So uh, this was a fluoride varnish trial. Um, this is a Weintraub paper published in 2006 um, from San Francisco to um, community health centers. Um, and it, overall, if you combine um, kids with any fluoride varnish versus kids with no fluoride varnish, we saw an uh, odds ratio of about one-third, so uh, about one-third in terms of reduction. Um, but what was seen here is that kids with more baseline mutans, so this is their baseline mutans levels, the more mutans they had, uh, the more effective the fluoride varnish was and the more benefit they, they got. So uh, if you look at this green line is um, around one-third, uh, so this is, this is the, the benefit, the additional benefit if, by targeting um, to those kids. Um, 
So next, I wanted to talk a little bit more about social determinants of health. Um, this is a, also an old uh, California oral health needs assessment of children, uh, statewide survey. So these are the 186 schools where the um, screenings were performed um, using the uh, Association for State and Territorial Dental Directors design, uh, measuring these oral health measures of uh, caries indices and treatment urgency. Um, and looking at these various factors, um, uh, demographics, uh, so we do have um, race, gender, age, and as well as um, socioeconomic status. So socioeconomic status, we, because they were done as a school-based survey of kindergartners and third graders, we um, used a measure which was the free and reduced or reduced cost lunch program participation. So we had both for the individual student, but we also had what was the percent of kids at that school. So among the 186 schools, what's the percent of kids at that school? And then we had something, uh, the California Academic Performance Index, which was a measure, uh, a rank score, one to 10, of how good the school is. Um, and then we had a measure of acculturation, which was at the school level. Um, so this is showing the percent of kids with rampant caries um, by race. So um, the Hispanic kids had the, the highest percentage, and this is um, uh, versus the um, non-Hispanic whites is the reference. Uh, this is versus um, an ch individual child not being uh, on the free or reduced cost lunch program. And this is um, a school being in the first, uh, less than 25% of kids in a school being on the free and reduced lunch program. So we can see the Hispanic kids, um, as I said, had the highest among uh, the different races and ethnicities um, that being on the free reduced lunch program was uh, an important impact for an individual kid. But even more important was the community factor, the school level effect. So if you were, if you were not on it, but you were in a school, regardless of whether you, you personally were on it or not, if you were in a school that had 75% or more of the kids on the free and reduced lunch program, um, you had the higher than your race ethnic than than the highest race ethnicity, higher than the individual level. So um, the the community impacts can matter and can make a as a, a big impact there. Um, but we should also think beyond um, the income. Uh, and so in this paper, uh, using the same data set, uh, Dr. Gloria Mejia who's um, back in Adelaide, Australia, now um, looked at uh, the percent of uh, English language learners at each school. And so we didn't see any effect using these health disparity indices. We didn't see any statistically significant effect. All of these um, co confidence intervals cross, um, cross one, uh, zero. Uh, but we, we, um, we did see statistically significant effect of the uh, um, early language learners, uh, percent early language learners. So um, this is, uh, this one was, for, sorry, this one was for um, uh, sealants, uh, lacking a sealant. So um, we saw language as being a big impact. So it, it, we shouldn't just look at the income. Um, so the last thing that I wanted to talk about, so that's an, an example of social determinants of, of health. Um, the different kinds of impacts and ways to, to think about those and not just think about um, income and poverty. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, population versus high risk. And so um, for a very long time in public health, we have talked about targeting risk. And, um, and so this goes back to, it's, I'm sure it goes back further than that, but, but Lalonde in Canada had a big impact in people's thinking. Um, prevent disease in higher risk individuals. Sounds good, makes good sense, but there are reasons why that hasn't worked out. Um, in some cases, it blames the victim. In some cases, it's, it's hard to deliver care to individuals in that way. It's hard to reach the ones who are at the highest risk as an individual. Um, and so, uh, in, uh, Rose has been attributed with this whole population approach um, with, uh, but the pr a problem with this which is given, given intervention to the whole population and um, 
with a rising tide lift all boats. You might have heard that phrase before. Um, the, but this has a problem in that it can, even though it can increase overall public health, it might also increase disparities. Um, and so it's not uh, an either or, there is a third way. And so um, there's this more recent paper um, talking about targeting the vulnerable populations or communities. And really that's what we need to do and that's what we're talking about. And, uh, and that will actually help reduce the disparities while also improving the overall public health. And so this is also known as proportionate universalism or gave rise to proportionate universalism. So um, we just had new inductees in the Hall of Fame for baseball. So I'm gonna use a baseball analogy here. Um, and this was a, a tweet that, that Sir Michael Marmot tweeted. I figure if, a, if someone's knighted, I can quote their tweets, uh, that he, he tw retweeted somebody else. Um, so equality is everybody gets the same thing. Uh, equity is where everybody gets um, what they need in order to view the ball game. But often, Reality is even worse than, um, than equality. So uh, our work might be cut out for us, but we're still up for the challenge. Um, so in proportionate universalism, uh, it's like that middle slide that basically we want to um, provide um, the, the, uh, the actions that are proportional to the need. Um, and the way to do that is to uh, give it through communities rather than through individuals as um, was first shown there. So, um, so in precision proportionate universalism, um, public health needs to answer these questions of who, what, when, who, what, where, how. Uh, and um, we talked about this a little bit earlier or uh, the, Sarah talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, identify the vulnerable groups um, and the right intervention, uh, identify uh, where they are, and, and then deliver that to them. Um, so, how are we doing on time? We're good? Okay. So, um, so that's what I mean when I say proportionate universalism, and I have to thank um, folks like um, Richard Watt for um, pointing that out to me, uh, and, um, and, and folks who are uh, involved in global oral health inequity work as well. Um, so the next thing I wanted to show you was a little bit to, to uh, talk and address in a way some of the discussion that we had earlier about the representativeness and are we going to get the right people to participate in all of us. Um, and so I wanted to show you this vid video. Um, has anybody seen this video already? Okay, just a few people. Okay, good. So much of what we've done in medicine over the years has not really taken into account individual differences. We're really building a fundamental base of knowledge about how humans stay healthy or get sick and what to do about it. I think the practice of medicine will be altered in profound ways. Moms, dads, brothers, sisters, people who are healthy, people who are sick. We want to work with you and make our lives better. The whole idea of precision medicine is to be able to use individual differences to tailor prevention care that they receive. We're building a set of capabilities with a million or more volunteers to figure out how do we enable targeted, customized care for an individual based on as much data as we can get about them. I'm very excited about it having a million people in a cohort, it gives us the ability to look at not just common diseases, but rare diseases. When you have a million people, even a rare disease, it may affect a hundred people. This is something that we are invested in, and we want everybody who has a perspective to be able to share that perspective. The more diverse representation we have, the better outcomes we can give back to the public. Being able to bring communities of color, not only to contribute to science, but to contribute to our ability to understand the nuances within those populations. It is important for minorities to be a part of this, or we will again be left with medications that are created for really other populations. It's definitely important to have participant engagement and individuals being partners from the ground up. With all of the information that we're going to garner from this study, it is going to help with prevention. Prevention is really what the key right now to longevity. It's about health, it's about disease, it's about behavior, it's about environment. Why not? You know, why not participate? Why not be part of it?
the organizers are, are aware of the issues. They're visiting the places. Uh, their their goals are laudable, but I, you know, the real um, results are they going to be able to engage and enroll the people that were, that are they're after is going to be what's going to really tell all. Um, I think I will skip this one. Or, or do we have time? Or it... oh. Okay, so um, I'll show this one also, and the reason I wanted to show this, um, uh, I think it's also, this one is a very powerful video, and I think this gets into so some of the issues about the marketing, and that we don't do a good, as good a job as in marketing uh, as um, big sugar and big tobacco and so on. And this is a little bit old, um, uh, from 2013. Um, it's not necessarily public health, it's more um, um, precision medicine, um, but I think it's really powerful, and if we think about how do we, um, how do we make changes, uh, we tell stories of individuals. We uh, engage um, legislators and funders and sponsors with stories of individuals who will be impacted and will be benefited from this kind of work. And so um, I think this is a really great example of, of that kind of material. This is Georgia. She's not a Caucasian female aged five to nine. She's not the sum of a stack of pages and a clipboard or a PDF. She's not just the only child born at precisely the strike of midnight on July 5th, because she's not a number. She is Georgia, the daughter of Theodore and Sylvia. She likes to finger paint, and her best friend Sarah, and having tea parties with her dog, Senior Crumbles. Someday, 20 years from now, 25, maybe 30, she has a slight chance of developing triple negative breast cancer, which is a nasty name for a nasty disease. It's only a slight chance, and it's 20 years away, but for us, that's too much. To us, that's too soon. That's why we do what we do for Georgia. Join us. Go to meforyou.org to dedicate action now to bring the future of care forward. UCSF, we're all in this together. Um, okay, so, uh, you know, the Truth Campaign, groups like that do great jobs of, of um, developing materials to reach the people uh, in the, with the right messaging, and um, so the, I think that's an area that uh, taking precision public health, that we're gonna have to really uh, pick up the mantle and carry that. Um, all right, so we are now at the crossroads and we have the opportunity to choose a direction, um, where to take things, um, and, and perhaps um, decide which bargains we will strike in order to get there. And um, so it's a very exciting time. There's a lot of opportunity here. Um, and so I hope that everyone um, feels like you're prepared to, to move forward into the world of precision public health. So thanks, and move into discussion. Dental sealants, right? Yeah, actually there were two separate studies. So one had um, measurements in moms and kids and the other one um, had only measurements in kids and had the fluoride varnish. So sort of on a limited basis, reflecting on my understanding of, of the literature, I thought that we had come a ways to talk about transmissible infectious diseases and tooth decay in children was an example. And yet, in the dental literature, we have people writing about non-communicable diseases, and they call it, as an example, dental caries. So I guess I'm interested in, if we want to solve a problem, then we have to come to some agreement in defining the problem. And if there really is transmissible uh, of an infectious disease between caregiver and newborn infant, then why don't we brand eradicate tooth decay as if we eradicate other infectious diseases? What do you think? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting question. I've heard um, some folks respond and say that um, caries is both a communicable, transmissible, transmissible communicable disease and a non-communicable disease. 
And you sort of scratch your head and say, well, how can it be both? It seems like an either or. And um, so I think what they do is divide up caries into how you first get it, which is transmission of bacteria, versus um, the lifelong process once you have it, um, and that that is a chronic disease. So I think the issue is that we went away from using the term, the general term chronic disease for a whole slew of diseases to uh, non-communicable diseases, which um, might be the terminology from the World Health Organization. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. And so um, it, put, it does put caries in this um, strange position because for so long it had been in the chronic disease um, groups or group of diseases. Um, but there's definitely a transmiss transmissible uh, component to it. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think that some people have been um, folk, folk, I guess it depends on, in some ways on the age uh, of the patients that you focus on. So when you're talking about kids, we often will talk about it more as a communicable disease. Um, and in adults, I think um, people refer to it as um, a, a non-communicable disease. Um, I know that there has been work to try to develop a caries vaccine. There's been work to try to develop the uh, bacterial profile uh, of, of um, bacteria that are responsible. Um, there have been, you know, studies that have tried to do, say, uh, genetic fingerprinting of specific strains of specific bacteria. Um, and, and, you know, that work continues, uh, particularly with the microbiome. So I think that the, having the microbiome and the work in, in that area uh, opens up more avenues to delve deeper into it. But um, I think that it's not as simple as we once thought it was. I think that's, uh, you know, simply saying that you have um, a certain number of bacteria is, isn't, the, um, isn't both necessary and sufficient conditions for developing caries. So, yeah, uh, we're still uh, working on that, I think. Stuart, if I could, uh, I've got a mic in front of me, so I'm going to use it. Um, thank you for your presentation. I have to say that because we're colleagues at UCSF. No, it was really great. Uh, <laughs> um, so, what is caries? You showed a slide uh, that uh, distinguished uh, uh, by the number of cavities or fillings, uh, the DMF, uh, one category was more than seven, and that was considered rampant, I think, was part of the slide? Yeah, right. So that's the ASTDD uh, basic screening survey. Right. So, um, so they just have a yes or no, is it seven or more teeth that are involved? Right. They don't have full mouth exams. So in the 93-94 in the survey that you mentioned, um, we had pages and pages of a thick document of, of data, uh, and we uh, categorized uh, individuals by, uh, or groups of individuals, by the number of uh, lesions that they had. So uh, at that time, I think it was more than nine was, was uh, the, the, the standard, perhaps, uh, that other states had used. So I don't think... Uh, carries is carries is carries. I think in terms of the way we measure it, uh, as a practicing dentist and having seen a lot of uh, uh, other dentists work, uh, I know that if you have a buckle pit on a lower molar filled by a dentist, that would get categorized as carries. But it may be just the propensity of that dentist to drill into that small little hole without a local anesthetic and put amalgam in there. Uh, and I think that's a very different kind of condition than the individuals with multiple lesions or, or restorations in, on their teeth uh, that go beyond the simple pit and fissure type restoration. So when, you, when we look at uh, who's got disease, who's not got disease, I think we have to really look at uh, those with um, significant 
uh, carries, uh, rather than just looking at everybody in the DMFT category. Could you speak a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, I think anytime you, you categorize something as a yes, no, uh, it's a pretty blunt instrument and you're, you're losing a lot of information. And so um, if you have full mouth exams yet, you're able to, to look at the full distribution and identify, uh, you know, what is really meant. And, um, you know, there are, is a definition of ECC and a definition of severe early childhood caries. Um, uh, that's been published, and then more recently, I guess it's been um, questioned whether that we should be using that. But but it's it's more than a yes no that goes into that, or it's more than um, a simple cutoff of the, the a DMFT or a DMFS. Um, the um, ASTDD seven or more teeth, uh, not surfaces, but teeth involved, I think is a pretty extreme uh, version. Uh, I have looked at some NHANES data and looked at, um, you know, different cutoffs um, and how to sort of uh, look at different definitions of ECC and severe ECC um, in preschool age children uh, in NHANES data set. And, you know, the definition that you choose, uh, the criteria you choose changes the percent of, of kids, uh, the prevalence quite a bit. So I think we have time for one more question, and Dr. Gansky is actually facilitating the discussion session next, so you, you might find that you'll have time to interact or get your question answered at that time, too. Either one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay very, uh, thank you uh, so much for the presentation. It was a very nice and a smooth transition for modeling all the way to the you know social determinants and caries prevention and all that. Uh, I'll, I'll go and start with the kids who are at high risk of caries. Uh, I think they, they have a problem, which is not really mentioned a lot, you know, through the presentations I've ever uh, been hearing before, that most of the kids who have high caries risk are those who does not eat fruits and vegetables, and all that they eat are, uh, is, is sugar, uh, basically. So I think this is basically is a risk by itself rather than they are you know, poor, have, don't have insurance and, and all of that. So I'm not sure how that can be modeled or you know, taken in, into consideration. The other thing that I would, be, uh, would like, because you mentioned modeling, I know modeling is very complicated. I just you know, um, uh, got into that you know, b briefly before. And uh, there, it's very difficult to make one model for all people. So maybe to split them, like people who are at, who are at high risk should have a specific model, or their own model, moderate risk, moderate risk uh, their own model, and people who are at low risk, more own model, because all the factors are different. Or even the, you know, the behavior, all of that is completely different. So to, you know, Put all of them in one mall and try to predict the caries is, is extremely difficult, I, I, you know, I think. The other thing which might be a little bit uh, far away from, from all of that, if we know that uh, the care system in the US is a little bit different than universal health care system in other countries like UK and Canada, which we can't really cover th those people who are at high risk, why there is no advocacy for people who are at uh, high risk, especially kids, to have at least their dental bar to be fully covered and their parents to be fully covered. Just all the, those people to have a universal health care system because, you know, they really need this care to, to be, you know, the, because we can't really cover their poverty and other things. Why we don't cover their, you know, dental care, their, the parents and the, the kids. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, in terms of the models and developing uh, more specific models or stratifying models based on, um, say, risk or on some other characteristic, maybe, um, maybe sex, maybe race, ethnicity, some, maybe um, you know, poverty status or region. Um, some of these methods are actually really good at developing uh, models with lots of interactions. So if, for example, if... Um, uh, the example you used, risk status. So um, if risk status is actually really important, it would come in as an interaction in those models and you would get, uh, like tree models are really good at developing uh, very specific subgroups. Um, so developing the model would, would be uh, pretty easy to use 
do with some of the methodology. Uh, but then the issue is it needs to be validated and it needs to be shown to be the case for not just the data set in which it was developed, but in reality uh, to make it work. Uh, but I agree that that, that uh, it's not a one size fits all even on a mo risk model or a prediction model. Um, in terms of, um, you know, health for children, health care coverage for children, um, there, there actually has been um, a huge change in the United States because of CHIP uh, in terms of children's health care and also um, oral health care and, and more kids with oral health care. So, um, so it's actually improved um, tremendously in the last, uh, I think, two decades. Uh, but even if you look at a longer time profile, um, using some measures like, have you had a visit to the dentist in the last year? Um, over the last uh, 50, 60 years, um, it's actually improved nationally in the whole population um, tremendously. Um, but that having a dental visit in the last year doesn't mean that you get the right care, that you get appropriate care, that you're being seen for, for prevention and not for extractions. Uh, so that, again, is another blunt instrument for the way we measure things. Um, so I agree, I would, I would like to see um, I think uh, giving all kids uh, a chance and a, a good start and having um, oral health care would, would be great. Um, I hope that we can move further in that direction. And I think you had a third part, but I can't remember the first portion. Was there a question in that one? Oh, sorry, yeah, right, so nutrition. Yeah. Um, uh, Measuring diet is, is pretty difficult, and, and there are lots of different ways you can measure it. Um, you know, 24-hour recall, three-day food diaries, and other methodologies. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Chaffee, uh, in his uh, work on his dissertation in Brazil, actually worked on a clinical trial where they used a um, checklist of foods, and they developed a... Uh, were able to narrow down the checklist and, and developed, uh, they classified, clustered different kinds of foods together and they, and they found that there were certain foods that were really high risk. Um, in Brazil, I guess they have these um, uh, like yogurt drinks or um, they have these, these drinks that have a lot of sugar in them. And, uh, and so there were some pr things like that that were common snack foods that were really highly associated with caries in kids. So um, I, I think because it's hard to measure, often we can't include that because uh, we don't have the budget to add that component, but it, we should think about that. And how do we get that data in the EHR, for example, uh, if we're talking about precision public health? How do we get that data? Um, or are we going to use community-level data um, that's come from some other source um, uh, about, you know, percent of the community that eats fruits and vegetables and, and so on. So I, I think that's a, it's a, a great point. Uh, we have not had the ability to include nutritional data as much as I would like. Um, okay, so great. So now we can move into um, our discussion session. Uh, and again, I think the idea is to use Slido. Um, and so one of the things about this conference um, that I suggested uh, to Dr. Capelli um, and he um, boldly embraced was um, I was trying to figure out a way to kind of create some of that working group from the Precision Public Health First Thousand Days Summit. And so, um, so they found Slido. And so we're actually trying to figure out ways to stimulate um, discussion around what when you go home after tomorrow, when you go home, what will you get out of here? What will you get out of this um, colloquium? So we're trying to get people to think a little bit about uh, how you might take some of this information and, and use it, put it into play. So the first question we have here is, um, what are some potential threats uh, from precision public health and precision health that might increase health inequities, um, things that, that maybe aren't up there yet, um, and so that we as a community of um, dental public health and precision public health folks can uh, can get an idea. I like
like that. We have two people who responded, but we had three answers. So we have funding issues, we have me variable measurement issues, um, rural communities being left out, um, the technology issues, not everybody has access. Um, cultural differences, uh, population diversity, so representativeness, generalizability. Um, we have groups that are maybe uh, just, just really, really difficult to get at, no matter what we do. Um, uh, they have other health issues um, that, uh, sorry, other issues in their life, like maybe uh, shelter, food, uh, housing, uh, th those sorts of things that, that uh, they're not even thinking about health at this point. Um, inaccurate interpretations, uh, we have issues of um, security, data security, um, discrimination. Okay, so is anybody still working on their thumbs uh, wearing out or something. Okay, should we move on to the next, the next one? Okay, so the second one is, what are some potential opportunities uh, that precision public health and precision health could utilize to reduce oral health inequities? So kind of like the example that I gave of um, making impacts to groups of people in substandard housing. So all it would take, for example, is to identify one child um, in a practice to impact the whole community uh, who live in, um, in housing owned by one, the same slumlord, let's say. Uh, what are some other sort of thinking outside of the box kinds of ideas? Okay, so we have the social vulnerability index, um, uh, making oral health care affordable, um, prenatal education and practice, um, aggregate, oh, oh, now they're coming too fast for me to read. Um, aggregate data analysis for lobbying for change of policies and funding. Um, targeting intervention to those uh, in most need, um, facilitating communities benefit, workforce development, improving products for people and the communities, um, improving, increasing outreach programs among at-risk people, improve access, collaboration of multidisciplinary groups, collecting data with those um, with oral health inequities, coordinating care, transdisciplinary teams, um, and adapting prevention measures uh, to the need of each. Um, Garnering community advocates to solicit resources for meaningful evidence-based initiatives. Looking at psychological components of patients in different populations. Great. Thanks, everybody. So I think we have time for one more. Um, so the last one uh, is what are some ways that you might incorporate the idea of proportionate universalism into your organization. And that is giving the amount of support and assistance that's needed to those most vulnerable groups. Yeah, so proportionate universalism. Um, if you think of the uh, photo or the, the um, schematic of the people watching the baseball game and being on the different boxes, so the box in the middle where the shortest person got the two boxes to help them see over the fence to watch the ball game. Um, 
and the middle person got one box, and the person who could already see over the fence didn't need any additional help. Um, so in oral health, we'd be giving some, some more help, some help to those who need some uh, help in order to have um, uh, optimal oral health, uh, and those who need more help would, would get more help, and it would be based on the grouping, the community, or the group that they were in. Um, so we have prioritize and meaningfully allocate resources, um, increase access based on language, like bilingual information, um, funnel resources to individuals most in need um, instead of general need, um, offer increased care coordination based on need, um, educating students, dental students and hygiene students to understand the role that health equity plays in health outcomes. Um, universal access to health care through a single payer system. Um, I didn't see, is Bernie, did Bernie Sanders come in? Um, valuation of targeted public health programs. Um, business case, savings with prevention. Sort of make the economic argument. Um, focus limited funding and capacity. Utilize relevant and accurate data to direct resources. Um, identify the need accurately to scale appropriately for increased equity. Um, do a webinar for state and community programs to understand the topic. Um, dental school curricula doesn't lend itself well to this important subject domain. Um, yeah, so we might think about ways to incorporate this into the curriculum. Um, post the, the cartoon uh, showing the health equity. Um, yeah, there's some more elegant um, ones uh, that weren't screen captures from a tweet uh, that, um, that uh, I've seen people use in their presentations. Um, oh, okay, sorry, there were, I forgot there were four questions. So we have one, one final question. Um, and so what are some potential family, community, state, and regional measures that might be used in precision dental public health to identify disease or improve health. Um, access to fresh produce, safe drinking water, uh, BSS, I think that's the basic screening survey, um, access to communities based on financial incentives on, on income levels, community water fluoridation, <clears throat> Rodeo, which is a, a data warehouse for oral health, uh, focused marketing to at-risk populations, community promotoras to connect members to the community, um, community engagement using community services, WIC participation, parents' perception of overall and oral health, emergency urgent visits versus routine care, regional health information networks, incentivize individual data collection to understand genetic components, incorporate into surveillance, cavity-free years is a new measure, uh, set requirements to receive benefits, no food stamps for those with children who have untreated decay. So a, a uh, results-oriented um, parental oral health education. complex measures of in inequality in biomarkers. Food bank, creating stakeholders and active community groups. <coughs> Emphasis on community-based preventive services. Okay, so um, 
this was a bit of an experiment. Hopefully, uh, I'm sure that um, the team will evaluate or ask you for your opinion on whether you like this uh, at the end of the colloquium. Uh, but this is a little bit of an experiment, so um, I want to thank everyone for participating in this. I know not everybody is uh, into social media or using their phones all the time or um, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but we thought it was a way to try to um, address some of the issues from the last year's colloquium where people felt like the discussion time was too short and not everyone got to be heard. So uh, we felt like this would be a way for people to um, be able to express their opinions, ask their questions, and for everybody in the, our group to also be able to see them. Um, and as, was, as Dr. Capelli mentioned earlier, these will be um, uh, archived, and so you'll be able to revisit those as well. Um, so thank you very much.